Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. Now, many of you will know that aside from my main um, pursuits in HEMA, Historical European Martial Arts, I have a sideline passing interest in Indian martial arts and Indian weapons. I've got some right beside me here, so some antique uh, Indian tulwars there, that's an Afghan polwar, uh, and you know there's another one down here, and there's, I've got various other things in my collection. And um, obviously it connects very strongly to my uh, main focus in historical European martial arts, which is um, British military martial arts of the 19th century. And obviously, a big part of uh, British um, empire and British military life was connected to India in the 19th century. Now, um, sort of connected to that is this. What is this? Well, first of all, um, I should say that for about... Uh, maybe eight years, I have owned a smaller version of this, uh, which very quickly was pilfered by my wife Lucy and has been used as her main buckler ever since. It is obviously a small shield, although this is a slightly larger one. Um, and uh, at uh, just before Christmas, in fact, I became aware of the fact that there was a company in the UK who'd started selling these again. I got my original one from a Gatka group years and years ago, probably like 15 years ago, something like that, and I loved it. Um, and it was actually my preferred buckler for use. Uh, I think somewhere on the internet you can even find um, uh, footage of me fighting in a tournament in Dijon many, many years ago against Arto Fama, and you can see me using that buckler there. Um, and I think that was probably, I think that was probably in about uh, 2008 or something like that. And maybe, yeah, about 2008, I think. And um, I was using a smaller version there. Uh, now, this type of shield is uh, usually, refer I mean, you could just call it a buckler. You could call it a shield. That's absolutely fine. Uh, but they're usually referred to as a DAL, D-H-A-L. Um, now, um, you can, in other areas, find shields very similar to this. So this is a type of shield which is used in Gatka, also used in Shasta Vidya, uh, any Indian martial art, basically, because this is the type of shield, or and I'll talk a little bit more about the variations in a second, but it is uh, roughly uh, indicative of a type of shield that was very popular in India from about the 16th, 17th century, right the way through to the 20th century, in fact, and still um, in, uh, you know, in martial arts applications today. Now, this shield itself, the actual design of it, really comes more from Persia. It's not indigenous to India as such. It's a star that was brought in uh, more or less during the uh, Mughal invasions uh, of the 16th century. And it, it, we would often refer to this style as Indo-Persian. The, the reason that we refer to weapons like these and this as Indo-Persian is because there's a lot of backwards and forwards uh, mutual um, sort of transfer of material culture, so things like weapons and clothes and other things, uh, between what was then the Persian Empire and what we now know as India. Now remember, of course, that India um, back then wasn't a country in the sense that it is today. India was an area that consisted of lots of different uh, kingdoms and uh, religious uh, areas of different religions and different cultures even different languages, different dialects of those languages. And uh, some of them were obviously more connected to Afghanistan and Persia, or Iran as it's now known. Um, but of course the Persian Empire was much bigger than just Iran then. Um, and other areas were less uh, connected and related to those uh, parts. So we do indeed, coming back to the shields, find that these types of shields were um, more popular in some areas than others. Uh, particularly in uh, areas with more Islamic influence, but that's not only the case. Obviously, for modern uh, Gatka, for example, which is essentially a Sikh uh, martial art, uh, but related nevertheless to uh, Kalare Piatu and other martial arts from other areas, uh, these were used in the Punjab as well. Obviously, there were lots of Muslims in the Punjab, but obviously a lot of Sikhs as well. Um, and so this style of shield was used all over India, 
but it wasn't the only type of shield. There were other types of shield in India. Nevertheless, this, and, and incidentally in Persian, this would be called, a, I think it's Sipa or Sepa, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. So there are different names for this type of shield, but let's just call it a shield. Now, this is, uh, I've linked below to where I actually got this from. I'm going to do a minor kind of light touch review of this in a second. Um, but this is, historically speaking, a medium size one. In terms of the website linked below, this is their largest one. Now, it's unfortunate they don't do an li even larger one. If they did a full size one, I would absolutely buy it. Please do that. Uh, Punjabi Roots guys, if you're watching this video, um, and I will forward it to you, so hopefully you will see it. If you can get these made in uh, full size, so kind of 50% bigger even than this, maybe even a bit more than that, uh, then I think loads of people will want to buy them. I certainly will. Um, this type of shield, just to go backwards a little bit into what I was saying, this type of shield was used... Um, over a very, very wide area, not just not what we now call India, but also down into the Ottoman Empire, Turkey. Um, so the Ottoman Turks used shields very like this, the Persians, uh, all of, the, North, um, uh, all of uh, the Middle East and a little bit of North Africa. So if we go into what's now Egypt, um, the Egyptian Empire used shields like this, um, obviously because of partly they were part of the Ottoman Empire for a large chunk of time. Um, so huge areas of the kind of Islamic world and India as well, use this type of shield. Um, now, you'll notice they are characterized by being round, by being domed, and by having at least four um, breast-like knobs on the front, okay? Uh, the one in the middle is optional. Uh, lots of these do not have that, but some of these shields do have one in the middle. Um, and some of them don't only have four knobs, some of them have more. Uh, very often you find on the larger shields there are six. The reason for that is these four knobs are indicative of rivets which go through the face of the shield and come out the back and are attached to end arms or straps basically. And you'll notice actually uh, on this replica just as on the originals there is a ring. So essentially a rivet goes through here and is protected by that dome. And then there's a ring on the inside, and that ring is used to secure straps. Now, uh, obviously on this there are two straps. I could put my arm through the first one and grip the second, so some of the larger shields are gripped like that. Or indeed, if it's an even larger shield with six of these um, sort of knobs here, then you would actually have three straps at the back. So you'd have two straps here and another one there, in which case you slide your hand through the first two and grip the last one. If it's a smaller one, like a buckler, this is really kind of a big buckler. Um, it, it's a little bit big for a buckler size, but the smaller ones you get are true bucklers. Then you still have two straps at the back, but instead of putting your hand entirely through the first one, you simply grip those two together. Now, one of the reasons that I prefer, personally, this style of grip to the European simple bar across the back, is this gives you, for me, a really, really secure grip it's very comfortable in the hand. You can squeeze those two straps together and it gives you a lot of directional control and leverage of the buckler. Um, so that's the first reason that I personally prefer these to most European bucklers, um, because you can direct the edges and the face more easily than you can with a simple bar grip. But the second reason that I prefer these are these projecting knobs because they're actually really, really useful at impeding the travel of a blade, be it in a thrust or a cut, or indeed if it's not a blade, something like a spear shaft. Those provide really useful reference points for friction. And often what you find with bucklers is when cuts come down, usually you'll defend with the weapon and the buckler together. Not always, sometimes you'll defend with the buckler alone. This is certainly shown in period artwork and very occasionally in treatises of the time. But usually in European treatises, the buckler and the sword are put together for a second and then break apart. Um, Sometimes the sword actually does the primary defense, for example, a rabat, if we're looking at something like Morozzo, um, you might have the sword does the primary defense, the rabat, and then the buckler takes over covering whilst you now uh, repost with your weapon. But when you're using this type of shield, what you find is if you do just uh, defend either deflecting or just straight blocking with this type of buckler, then having those projections on the front 
somewhat similar it has to be said to a Highland Taj because Highland Tajes are covered in studs and sometimes have a central spike then that really assists I find in um, slowing down or even stopping the movement of the opponent's weapon. Now that's not to say that European bucklers can't do that as well. Um, some European bucklers have ridges or projecting bits like these do or they have um, a boss in the centre which achieves a similar um, purpose or indeed you get the uh, the uh, kind of corrugated targa as it's called in Bolognese swordsmanship uh, which can achieve a similar result of kind of almost capturing the opponent's blade. But without going too much further into that, uh, let's have a little look at this dull. So first of all, this is steel. A lot of the originals were actually made of leather. Um, but historically, we do get steel examples like this. So, you know, the modern ones, it's easier to make a steel out of sh uh, steel now um, than it is to make it out of thick leather. Historically, it would have been the other way around. It would have been more expensive and difficult to make it out of steel, and it would have been easier to make it out of leather. In terms of the differences between the two, steel is relatively speaking heavier than the leather ones. I actually have two antique leather ones in my own collection. Uh, in fact, technically one of them is Lucy's and one of them is mine, but uh, the leather ones are lighter, uh, but the steel ones do probably offer better protection by and large against most things. There is some peripheral uh, benefit to having a leather buckler in that it can sometimes uh, catch um, po particularly points but even edges as well and perhaps slow down and impede the travel. If a point went into the leather buckler that could actually be quite an advantage because of course it's a bit like grabbing the opponent's weapon. If the point goes in and gets stuck, same with a wooden shield, you're able to wrench it aside and riposte in that time. That's very unlikely to happen with a steel shield but the steel shield is obviously more robust and protective against most weapons. Um, in terms of this one, yeah, it's made of uh, domed steel, uh, I would imagine pressed, the edges are rolled, it's been painted. If the painting is not to your taste, just paint over it. Um, I actually thought it'd be really fun to look up a historical example and paint it like one from a museum or something like that. Um, but you could absolutely do that. If you enjoy painting, spray this over with a new base coat and Bob's your uncle, you can paint away with whatever pattern you like. I actually rather like the one as it comes here. As you'll see on the link below, this is their largest size. They do a medium and a small as well. Um, the other one I've got I think is a medium uh, and I know someone who has a small. They're all good, they're all just varying sizes of buckler. Um, and they all have the same method of attachment which is very good. I have, through using the other one for years, noticed one kind of weakness of the, of the product as it were is that these pads get um, worn away quite quickly. They're not particularly robustly made but they're quite easy to fix, they're quite easy to replace, so I don't think that's a major thing. If you're using uh, sparring gloves, maybe even something like the Red Dragon gloves, you might find that you just want to pull that pad out and not even bother with the pad, because you've already got enough on the glove as it is. Um, so uh, you might also find that these straps are a little bit short. For me personally, with this pad and with them being that far apart, this is about, oh, that is about as small as they can be. I could do with a little bit more length on these straps, but again, you could replace those, adjust those, fix those really, really easily. It's a, it's a, a kind of an hour's work just simply to replace those with leather straps to your own choosing. Um, so very easy to do. And really, for how much these cost, I think this is a great little toy to have it in your training kit bag. Um, whether you're doing 19th century martial arts or whether you're toying with Indian martial arts or whether you're just a medieval uh, martial arts person doing sword and buckler and you want to try out a different style of buckler. Remember, even though you might think, oh, well, you know, I don't do 19th century Indian stuff, but these were in use in 16th century Ottoman Empire as well. So the, a lot of the treatises that you're looking at for the Renaissance, for example, uh, Paula Sectomer, Joachim Meyer, whatever, they, the, you know, the Viennese and the, the Germans and the Austrians and the various other people of Europe who came into combat in conflict, you know, Malta, for example, with the Turks in the 16th and 17th centuries and indeed all the way through to the 19th centuries would have encountered people using shields like these. And we know these were used in parts of Europe, for example, in the Balkans, in areas with Ottoman uh, influence and parts of Eastern Europe as well. So. 
Uh, Punjabi Roots, the links below to where you can get these. These are really cool uh, shields. For the, for the amount of money they are, I mean, I highly, highly recommend them. I personally prefer these to European bucklers. They come in three different sizes. And guys that make these, if you're watching this video, please make bigger ones because I really want a full size shield one. Um, and my intention, I actually bought two of these. One is for my wife Lucy and one's for me. I think this is loose. No, this is mine. No, this is Lucy's that I'm holding. Uh, mine's in my kit bag. Um, I'm actually intending to experiment a little bit with 19th century stuff. I actually want to make a, a Tolwar uh, simulator um, with a curved sabre blade I've got and at some point get a, a simple kind of hilt uh, with a simple knuckle bow on it and practice doing a bit of um, Indian style sword and buckler stuff uh, against sabre as well because why not? It's good fun. Uh, anyway, there we go, the Indian Dal shield, a little bit of historical background and context. Not just an Indian shield, an extremely, one of the most popular shield designs from history, in fact. I love them, I think they look awesome, and you can buy one, at least of this size or smaller, right now from the website linked below. Cheers for watching. Thanks for watching, we've got extra videos on Patreon, please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks.